Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm John Brindle, I'm your chair for this session. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Andy Raystrick, who's going to take you through um, leading a project team in a hybrid working environment to facilitate institutional VLE improvements, or I'll let you do the subtitle. There we go. Or a game of two halves. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I've been at the conference now for almost two days. I've seen some fantastic presentations. I've seen some fantastic content and some fantastic slide decks. You're not going to get a fantastic present presentation today because I'm not a natural presenter. And my slide deck looks like it was put together by a 12 year old. So I apologize for that in front. Hopefully you'll find it charming and innocent rather than just plain rubbish. Uh, I'm going to split the presentation into two halves. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about the project that we've done with our VLE and what we're doing with our VLE with a go live of September this year. Um, uh, and then the second half, I'm going to talk to you about how using a hybrid working environment and specifically using Microsoft Teams can actually work really, really well for project management. Okay. So who am I? I'm Andy Raystrick. Uh, I am a program manager. I work in the strategic teaching and learning team at Huddersfield University, uh, which is part of our vice chancellorate. We're responsible for rolling out institutional projects to improve teaching and learning across the institution. OK, I was a learning technologist. OK, uh, so I do have a background in learning technology. But I've been doing project management now for probably seven years and the reason I moved into project management was we decided we needed to do a VLE review and um, I was the only person who had any skills in project management so it came over to me that was a two and a half three year project to do the requirements gathering procurement and rollout and at the end of that everybody realized I was a better project manager than I was an LTA so that's why I do project management now uh, I've been to some presentations today where people have told you their life story. I'm not going to tell you that. If you want my life story, get me after a couple of drinks this evening, then you'll get it whether you want it or not. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to set some context. And the reason I'm going to set some context is in the second half, we're going to talk about the context of people. And I want to set the context of our university. We come to this conference and we all think our universities are all pretty much the same. We're similar. We do the same kinds of things. We're not. And I actually think as a university, Huddersfield is quite divergent. OK, we have about 18,000 FTE students, depending on how you measure it and what year we're in. But we have. 75% of those are commuter students. OK, so 75% of our students are from our local community. So they are from within probably about a 30 to 40 mile radius of the university. That's kind of quite important to know, because what happens is we get students coming to the university who have intact peer groups when they come to the university and therefore trying to generate a sense of belonging amongst those students becomes quite problematic. OK. We also have a very high percentage of BAME students. OK. Uh, and that's reflected in our local community as well. So we have um, probably about 53% of our students are BAME students, okay? Now, bearing that in mind, we score really well on differential attainment. We have a very small differential attainment gap and we are still working hard to close that, okay? These are um, students by IMD code. So IMD is index of multiple deprivation. So um, IMD one is like the lowest. It's the most underprivileged areas. So it measures things like incomes, access to education, transport networks. Uh, if we look at this, you can see that we've probably got, again, about 75 to 80% of our students come from IMD one and IMD two. So they come from very underprivileged backgrounds. And then we look at entry qualifications. Uh, the majority of our students come to the university with BTECs and other um, level three qualifications. So quite a 
small percentage of students coming to us with A-levels, and that percentage is dropping as the BTECs increase. So we have a completely different student profile to the majority of the universities in the UK. There's very few universities that have a very similar profile to us. Okay. Avila is bright space. Okay. We got this six years ago. Uh, it got a great reception from students, and we have a brilliant relationship with D2L as suppliers. Uh, I would tend to say a VLE is a VLE, and actually Canvas, Blackboard, Brightspace, they all do pretty much the same thing in slightly different ways. Uh, for us, the great benefit of Brightspace is the relationship that we have with D2L. We see them as partners, not as suppliers. Okay, they help us. They come to our conferences, they advise us, they're interested in the pedagogy as well as in the actual technical aspects of the VLE. We have a fantastic relationship with them, we love them, okay? So now I'm gonna tell you what the project was. Just to, That's just all background as to where we are and what we're doing. Right, it's about the module handbook. Every module has a handbook. That handbook contains three elements of information. So it has institutional information that is provided by registry. So that's things about what you do if you need an extension to your deadline, what you need to do if you want an EC. It has things about academic misconduct in there. And then we have school specific information in there, which is stuff like, where do you go to in your school for support? What are the phone numbers? What are the email addresses of everybody? Where are the actual places within your school that you need to go? And then you have module specific information, which is things like your delivery schedule, your assessment schedule, the assessment details, the assessment weightings, the assessment grades. Uh, so we unpick that. Now, I'm making a massive assumption here that everybody has a module handbook. All universities have module handbook. I'm getting some nods, which is really encouraging. So I'm gonna flip over to Menti. And if you get your devices out, I would be really interested to know how you present your module handbooks to students. And why is that not presenting my results? There we go. That's great. Okay. So a word or a PDF embedded within the VLA. Okay. Three universities doing it embedded at the point of need in the VLA. Two doing a different system to the VLE, and one says other. Who was the one who said other? How are you delivering it, please? We don't have a handbook for that, so everything's right. broken down more granular than that. So okay. There's like links here and everywhere in the VLE, but also on student portal and there's PDFs in other places. Well. Right. Okay. So, 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 just to repeat for the people who are watching virtually, um, one of the universities here has kind of a disaggregated version across very different systems. Some stuff in the VLE some stuff on other systems across the university. Right, okay, so I'll tell you what we were doing. So our own delivery model was a Word document, like the majority of you here, which was held on the document management system and then linked to from our VLE. Now it was linked automatically. Our central VLE guys ran some WYSI process that created a link in each module every year to the current version of the module handbook. Okay. Uh, when we looked at it, we had some issues with that mechanism. Number one, 
students tended to access it at the beginning of the module only. And we actually did some analytics on this to find out when it was accessed. And there was a peak in access as the module started, which then tailed off after a couple of weeks, and then hardly any access to that module handbook again throughout the course of that module. Okay. So that information wasn't at the point of need that the students needed it. Okay. If there was a change to a school or an institutional change, it became problematic because that meant that an institutional change, every single module handbook across the whole of the university needed to be updated. And sometimes that happens midterm. It's not necessarily something you can schedule for the summer. Okay, so that was a massive admin nightmare. Likewise, if, prob if things happened in the school, say for instance, the, su the support for students changed to a different department, there was a reorganization, all of that school's module handbooks needed to be updated and it was a manual process and again it was rarely visited throughout the whole of the term it was rarely visited so our vision was to actually disaggregate that information that was in the module handbook and deliver it at the point of need for the students that would give them easy access to the information throughout the module and it meant that we could have centralized school and student information in a template within our, mod within our module, which then propagated down to each individual module. So that's, sorry, central within our VLE, which propagated down to each module. So if there was a change to the institutional information, we just had to change it in one place. And all of a sudden, every single piece of information within all of the modules would be updated, okay? And we started to realize that by doing this as well, we were actually moving our VLE from being a content repository to being a proper learning environment. It wasn't just a content repository with a few um, multiple choice quizzes in there and some assessment points in there. It had all the information that the students needed at the point that they needed it. It was there in front of them. We also, during this process, thought, actually, you know what, if we do this as well, we're starting to give our students a parity of experience as they move between one module and another. And that's really important for us because we have um, six schools, now five because we've merged two of the schools, but we have students who study courses that span schools. So they're studying some modules in one school, some modules in another. By doing this and creating this disaggregated information, we were starting to standardize how those modules looked across the whole of the institution. That didn't mean that we were removing a degree of personalization that you could add to those modules. We felt that that was really important that we still left some personalization so that um, academics could stamp some personality on their modules, but we wanted a parity of experience for our students. So this happened over a year ago. Um, I'm going to come to that second bullet point first. Matthew and I'm riding and Liz Bennett. Uh, Matthew and I'm riding is an LTA. Liz Bennett is, um, uh, Professor Liz Bennett is our Director of Teaching and Learning in the School of Education, came up with this idea and they rolled it out within the School of Education. Uh, so that became our pilot. We got incredibly positive responses from the students about this. They thought it was great we got positive responses from the academics, okay? So we then took it to a number of institutional level meetings, showcased what we were doing. We took it around to each of the individual schools and said, this is what we're doing within education. Everybody wants that's, that's brilliant. In fact, I think the comment from our registrar when we suggested that we should do this was, why wouldn't we do this? So we put together a project team to do this. Okay. So it was all the learning technology advisors, one from each school. Um, we have a disaggregated learning technology um, system within the university, no central team. It's just LTAs within each school. And then we have a strategic LTA. Uh, we had two senior academics in there as well. We had our central VLE administrator, uh, and we had representation from registry because obviously registry are the people who determine what should go in the module handbook. 
Okay. So this is the process we went through. We took the template that education and professional development had developed and we institutionalized it. If you like, we made it slightly blander, something that we could roll out to all the different schools and all the different disciplines. We then got the LTAs from each school to take it to their academics and go, this is what we're thinking of implementing. What needs to change for our school? Because there are school differences and there are school disciplines. Uh, so we basically ended up with six different templates, one for each school. In essence, they were 99% the same. There was just some very minor tweaks that each of the schools made. In that process, we started to realize that the navigation bar, now the nav bar in, in Brightspace is like a bar at the top, which has drop down so you can access different tools within the VLE needed some rationalization. We had developed the navbar when we implemented Brightspace um, six years ago. It was a bit of guesswork. We didn't know which tools were going to be used, which tools weren't going to be used. So we decided at this point in time, now that we knew a bit better, we could rationalize that. Also, there were new tools that had been introduced that didn't sit on the navbar. You had to access them different ways. So we went through the ra rationalization of that as well to remove the clutter so the students weren't bombarded with tools that just were not used. And then we went into an early rollover process. In January, February this year, we rolled over all the academics modules because we realized that there was a lot of work for our academics to do to populate that module template, that handbook template within their modules this year and this year only. Subsequent years, we will roll that module over and they will just need to go back and make minor tweaks to it as things change for, for, the, for the subsequent years. So we rolled over the modules in January. We gave the academics a single step process to be able to copy their content across because we're aware that not all the content may have been in the modules by January. So basically we wanted to give them a module so they could start work on the module handbook. And then at any point in time, they could just do about three clicks and copy the content over from last year's module into next year's module. And we produced and delivered training. We produced some training centrally, and then we gave that to our learning technology advisors and said, you do what you want with this. You do what is best for your school. You roll it out as is best for your school. Make changes to this if you need to make changes to it. Just roll it out. So I'm going to come back to the navbar. Okay. So these are the things that we removed. We removed chat. Nobody used the chat anymore. Everybody uses Microsoft Teams. We used instant messaging. Nobody uses instant messaging. Everybody uses Microsoft Teams. Uh, we removed meetings. Microsoft Teams again has superseded it. Uh, the tools, the awards, the ePortfolio, the FAQ and the glossary. glossary. FAQ and glossary were hardly ever used. The ePortfolio, we started to realize, was a overarching tool and didn't have a place within the module. A student creates an ePortfolio that is module independent, so it made sense to take ePortfolio out of this and place it somewhere else within the VLA on the landing page. Uh, awards, that's like badges. No one was really using it. Uh, and the meeting scheduler we took off as well because that's linked into the meetings. All of those tools, with the exception of the ePortfolio, which we moved elsewhere, can be turned on again by the academic if they were actually using them. So by default, they're turned off and they don't show in the navbar. If they go down a couple of menu steps, click the button to turn it back on, they reappear. So basically, we simplified it. We got rid of the junk. Uh, and then we did a sales pitch. We're going to talk about sales pitches quite a lot later on. Okay, so we did two awareness sessions in each school, uh, organized by the directors of teaching and learning. Uh, so we should have got every single academic into those two sessions to tell them what was happening, to tell them why it was happening, to demonstrate what was happening. Uh, and again, we, we had positive response from them. No one said, oh, no, we can't do that. Don't like that. That's not going to work. Everybody was very engaged with it. Uh, we do some central learning bike sessions, uh, which are basically drop-in sessions, uh, different subjects each month. 
uh, and we did two learning bite sessions on this. Uh, we we deliver those virtually. We used to deliver those face to face. Since we've moved to virtual delivery of these, we've got much better engagement with them. Uh, for these two sessions, we got the best engagement ever. We got over 100 at one of them and 80 people come along to the next one, which is brilliant. Uh, and then we asked the LTAs, the directors of teaching and learning, the associate deans for teaching and learning to drive this forward in schools, which they did. Okay. So now basically it's handed over to the schools. We've rolled over the modules with a new template and we've handed it over to the schools. So it's down to the schools to push forward on populating those module templates. Uh, we have fortnightly, fortnightly team meetings to monitor the school progress. Uh, we talk regularly to the LTAs, the ADTs and the DOTLs. And we've also developed some reporting in Domo, which is a reporting tool attached to Brightspace to actually give the LTA some indication of which modules have been addressed, which modules have not yet been touched. So they can use those to go and speak to specific academics and give them the support they need. Okay, so let, let, let me show you some really quick examples. Um, don't, don't push me with any questions on this because I manage the project. I don't really fully understand what I'm showing you here, but um, just to show you what we're doing, Okay, so we have an information section at the top uh, and basically it contains useful information about the course and links to complementary resources. So that was our nav bar up at the top there, as you can see the bit that's highlighted. Okay, and then we have module support, talks about the module leaders, the course administrators, where to go. Uh, in the assessment areas, we have um, uh, assessment essentials, module assessment overview, and then we have the individual assessments underneath, which have got the briefs within them. In the assessment essentials, we get things like academic integrity and referencing information. So this is stuff that's pulled in from our registry central templates. Uh, within learning resources, we have delivery information. So we have a delivery schedule for each of the weeks, what's going on in the weeks, uh, what the activity is. Uh, and that's kind of it. If anybody wants to dig deeper into what we've actually done and how we've rolled this out and the structure behind it, I'm more than happy to take an email from you and I'll put you in touch with a guy who understands this inside out and really knows what, what to talk to you about. And our Go, go Live is Term 1 2023. And I guess if you were to ask me questions, you'd probably ask me about... Um, risks and issues, okay? Uh, we had a risk initially that our LTAs weren't re-engaged with the process because they didn't fully understand the benefit this would bring to our students, okay? All they saw it as was massive amounts of work for them. So um, by process of engagement and explaining and understanding their, their perspective on things, we slowly managed to bring them on board with this and got the engagement from them that we needed, okay? The other issue is that we have recently merged two schools into one, okay? And another school has gone through some um, substantial reorganization to the point where uh, the Dean and the Director of Teaching and Learning doesn't actually know who's teaching what modules next year and who owns what modules and who's going to be module leaders and therefore has no one to actually populate the module handbook. So we've come to an agreement with those schools that actually all they need to do for the start of term is to ensure that there is enough information in there to get the students through the first two weeks. And then that gives them another two weeks to sort themselves out, by which time they'll know who's teaching what module, what the timetable is, what the delivery schedules are. And then they have two weeks to bring that up to speed for the rest of the term. Questions? Hello. How um, have you tracked the uptake of early rollover editing? Okay, the question we had there was how do, how will we track the early uptake of rollover and editing? Uh, we we produced a um, report in a tool called Domo, which links into 
um, Brightspace, which can actually track when things have been edited in a module. So we can actually see when people have started editing and which sections they have edited. It doesn't obviously give us any quality information. It may be that they have just gone in there and put X's everywhere. Uh, so that's something that we are asking the LTAs to do once we've got some information in there to go and check the quality of that information that's going in there. Uh, but yeah, it's a central tool. The, LTA, the LTAs can run that ad hoc. We run it occasionally. Um, and if we see low engagement within a specific school, we will nudge that school. Steve. Is there any other applications in the future for this where you think the rollout of this with multiple handbooks? Or is there any other document that you guys kind of think is still applied to? The, yes. Um, the one thing that we're now thinking about is course handbooks. Okay, because um, Avili is very much a module based delivery mechanism. But actually, the majority of courses also have a presence on Brightspace. Now, I say the majority, that's not all of them. And we are starting to think that we could do this for the course handbook. I've got some people saying, no, we can't do that because all courses are so different that there's no standard template that we could apply to everything. Uh, that may be the case, but I think we need to unpick that first. Okay. Uh, that's the first thing that springs to mind. There's nothing else that at this moment in time I've thought we could disaggregate this. I, th I think there's a, there is a risk in doing what we've done and there'd be a further risk if we did this for anything else in a bright space perspective that the module actually becomes too cluttered. Okay. Now, the feedback we got from our pilot last year was it's not too cluttered, it's fine. We've got the information where we need it. I think there's a risk if we did anything else within the modules, it would be too cluttered and students would find it difficult to find what they need. All right, how are we doing on time? Right, okay. Oh, another question, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm open bright space as a product, this might be a value question. Um, is it built in Brightspace itself, or is it like a third party? No, the whole thing is built within Brightspace, complete, completely self-contained within Brightspace. Right, managing hybrid project teams. I have slightly overrun on that bit. I've got a quarter of an hour left, have I? No, no, you've got, um, you've got half an hour left. Fabulous. Yeah, that was good timing then. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Right. So... I want to talk to you about managing hybrid project teams. It's, it's what I do. I'm a project manager. Okay. So, yeah, again, set the context of our university. Um, we have a hybrid working policy where you can work at home 40% with agreement from your line manager. So three days on campus, two days working from home. Okay. Uh, some staff have fixed working patterns. So they'll be in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday home Thursday, Friday, every single week. Some, like me, work flexibly to suit the demands. I'm on campus when I need to be on campus. When I don't need to be on campus, I'll work from home. Okay? If I'm working from home in the morning and someone says, oh, my God, you need to be on campus this afternoon, I'm going to campus. I'm only 15 minutes away. <laughs> Some have roles that require 100% on campus. Can't get away from that. Okay? Some choose to be on campus 100% of the time. They don't have an ideal working environment at home. They would rather work in their office or on campus. Or some people actually just don't like working in isolation at home. They would rather there was some kind of social interaction to their job, which they get through working on campus. Okay. But when you're managing hybrid work, when a hybrid team, face-to-face -face meetings become problematic because of all of this. Because some people have fixed working schedules, so trying to get them to come in on a Thursday when Thursday is their work from home day, they don't want to do it. Sometimes you don't know who's working from home, who's working on campus at what particular point in time. Sometimes you need to call meetings at very short notice. Calling face-to-face call, -face meetings just become a nightmare. Okay. So... Uh, I, I'm going to jump all over the place with this. Now, I do apologise, and I'll probably try and bring it all back together at the end. 
Uh, I'm going to go back to Mente. Right, so if you could go to that, please. Oh, sorry, yeah, of course. Everybody got that? So the thing is, qualities of a project manager. Think of a good project manager. What qualities is it that makes them good? I, I, I like you guys. Or, organized is coming out top there, and I'm not going to dispute the project manager doesn't need to be organized. But actually, I've got some quite soft skill things in there, like communication, calm under pressure, available, realistic, practical, proactive people skills. I absolutely love approachable, communicator, communicative, Stakeholder management, that's what we're going to be talking about. Okay, clear communicator. So I ran this with a group of students, um, final year um, chemistry students. Nearly everything that came back was around being organized and structured and being able to plan. There was nothing about the soft skills. Okay. And at least you haven't put what one of my colleagues put when I did this, which was... Um, being able to nag people and write spreadsheets. Yeah, all gun charts are a good one, yeah. So, in my opinion, key skills of a project manager is how to win friends and influence people okay now um famous book by dale carnegie written in 1934 nearly everybody's heard of it hardly anybody's read it read it uh take into account the context of the time it was written which was 1934 a very different time to what we're living through now it has a slight um um atlantic cousin edge to it it has a slight sales pitch edge to it but it's a really good book. I read it when I was about 22. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about later on about how I'm, how I'm actually a really shy introvert and how that helped to change me. Okay, so as a project manager, you need stakeholders on your side. Without the stakeholders on your side and supporting your project, you have no chance of making that project a reality and realizing the benefits. Okay. And this is what gets overlooked all the time. Your project team are key stakeholders. They are the people that will make this happen and they need to be engaged and they need to be on your side as a project manager, okay? Without them on your side, it's gonna fail. There's no two ways about it, it is gonna fail. So as a project manager, you need to be a leader. You need to motivate, inspire, and lead your team to success, right? So we're gonna talk about the three pillars of rhetoric. I said I'm going to jump all over the place. So it will all come together, hopefully, at the end. Okay. Ethos, pathos, and logos, who are not the three musketeers. So ethos is about appealing to your audience's ethics. Okay. What is their ethos? You need to talk to them on a level that appeals to that set of ethics. Pathos is about appealing to your audience's emotions. 
And you can do that by using slightly emotive language, but also understanding what their emotions is, what makes them happy, what really does make them happy. A logos or logos, I never know how to pronounce that, is about appealing to your audience's rationality. So it's putting forward a, 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 an argument in a logical way to them or a pitch in a logical way to them. Now, what I did stand, what I have started to realize is ethos and pathos are inextricably linked. But actually, they underpin a perspective on reality, on rationality. Okay. So I can go in with what I think is a rational argument to somebody. But if I haven't understood their ethos and I haven't appealed to their pathos, it's not a rational argument to them. So you need to understand people's ethos and appeal to their pathos in order to put forward a rational explanation, a rational argument. Does that make sense? A little bit. I, I remember years ago and um, having conversations with a friend of mine who was deeply religious and I'm not. And I put forward rational arguments to him which he dismissed because I did not understand his underlying beliefs and ethos. So what was rational to me was not rational to him. So that's it. It's about understanding the ethos and the pathos. Okay. Uh, this is a slide on it from one of my other presentations. When you're a salesman, oh, sorry, when you're a project manager and you're doing stakeholder engagement, you are a salesperson. You are doing a sales pitch. In fact, on one of my courses on project management, I actually have a section called Selling Your Project. And everybody goes, oh, I'm not a salesman. It's like, but you are. Everybody can sell. Uh, and if you look at some of the bad salespeople you've had, they're pushy, they don't understand your needs, they haven't listened to you, they don't know what you're doing, they don't understand where you're coming from, what your ethos is. Good salesman listens to you and understands. He gets to know you, so he understands your ethos. He, he knows what makes you tick. And he sells a solution to fit your, your needs. And he produces that solution in a log logical and rational way. And this is what we're doing to get stakeholders on our side. So what I'm saying is building relationships underpins understanding ethos, pathos, and building a rational approach to enthusing, motivating, and leading a team. Okay. Once you've understood that ethos, pathos, it's a reciprocal arrangement so you build a relationship to understand the ethos and pathos then you use that ethos and pathos to actually build that relationship further okay it makes me sound really manipulative does this and i'm not honestly okay but you must build a relationship with every member of your project team as a project manager okay so now we're kind of going to come on to the bit about microsoft teams and why I think this is really good for doing that. Okay. So there's three things that Teams is used for large scheduled meetings. It's one of them. Okay. So the thing I noticed about Teams, and honestly, when we went into lockdown and I had to start running projects virtually rather than face to face, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I panicked, didn't just didn't know how to do it. As time went by, I started to learn. Okay, so in the large meetings, Teams meetings, Zoom meetings, work on the turn-taking paradigm, okay? So that means it's not dominated by the person with the loudest voice or the most opinions. People have to put their hand up. Everybody gets to have a say, okay? And that's really valuable because sometimes the people who are quieter are the ones that have the most to contribute to a meeting. Okay. So I would say that when you do go into a large meeting and you're chairing that large meeting, say, if you want to say something, put your hand up. I mean, naturally, Microsoft Teams is a turn-taking paradigm and people tend to, but be strict. So you have to put your hand up if you want to say something. Create an agenda for your meeting, but allow people to tangentially explore topics, okay? But know as a chair when to take something online and bring the meeting back to the agenda again, okay? And finish with a chance for everyone to contribute. Never go. Any other business from anybody? Because people won't say anything. 
You go, Mike, any other business? Claire, any other business? Abdul, any other business? Go around them one by one. Give everybody that chance to actually say something. You'd be surprised how many people still have something to say. Okay, I love this. I love the fact that it's that turn taking paradigm and the quiet people get a chance to talk. I was just ask, um, if you don't mind, um, there are pros and cons, aren't there? Um, and you were saying about perhaps um, uh, missing out on the opportunity to have a face to face uh, meeting. I accept everything you say there. And I think from a teaching and learning point of view, this also has the same attributes um, and it has mm -hmm. its, um, uh, the same uh, benefit. For example, the loudest voice doesn't uh, dominate. Um, but um, do, you, do you wish that you could have a blend of those face to face meetings, or do you still accept that in a face to face meeting, it's easier for somebody like me to interrupt you in this type of environment than sometimes in teams or not? I, I just had a question here for the people who are, who are tuning in digitally about whether a, a blended environment would be better for meetings, where sometimes we have um, face to face meetings as well, which allows that interruption and that discussion. Uh, and that, I suppose, more interactive discussion, isn't it, of, of, of topics? And the answer to that is yes. I think face-to-face -face meetings are still a necessity. And I think there are some things, and I'll talk about these a little bit later on, that you cannot achieve by using Microsoft Teams, or I haven't learned how to achieve just yet. Uh, and I think you're right. I think these are great for 80 to 90% of your meetings, but occasionally a face-to-face -face meeting allows that discussion the argument even if you want about something and that can be really productive Thank you. okay and then you have small meetings so small scheduled meetings so that's two three maybe even four people it tends to be people who kind of know each other quite well in those what i found is take five ten minutes to be social take five or ten minutes to talk about what you watched on netflix last night what you're doing at the weekend what you did last weekend when your next holiday is um, where you went on your cycle ride. Uh, it really helps because most people are working from home and they're not getting that social interaction. It helps me, I know, if I'm working from home to have that 10 minute social interaction with other people. Uh, so you're trying to build commonality with that. You're trying to get to know people. And actually, you can take some clues from their background environment. I was gutted when people started putting fake environments on their back because I loved getting a glimpse into people's lives. I've met people's children, people's cats. I've seen people with guitars hung on their wall. Uh, I've seen people who've got the same cushions that I've got from Ikea. And all of those have sparked conversations and enabled me to get to know people better and to build that relationship people with them. I have a colleague of mine who had a violin hanging on a wall. And I went, oh, violin, do you play violin? She went, yeah. She said, I spent my first 10 years being a professional violinist and realised there was no money in it, so now I work in registry. So you find out the most amazing things about people from their background environments. Uh, I, I hate the, the sort of like backgrounds you can put up. Okay. Give something of yourself, get something back. So if you're prepared to open up a little bit about you, if you're prepared to talk about what you did at the weekend, about what you did next, what you what you watched on TV last night, what you're going to do next weekend, where your cycle ride was, what you do for your hobbies, they are more likely to open up back to you and you will get to know them. This, this works outside teams as well. Okay. But I would say for this and the next one, recognize value and knocked upon their views and opinions. If someone says, I think we should be doing this, or we should think about this, and you go, yeah, that's a good idea, don't put your team's meeting down and do nothing about it and forget about it. Act on what they have said. If you can't act on what they have said, explain to them why you can't act on what they have said on their views and opinions. It's really important that you recognise those views and opinions and that you action them one way or another. Okay, and the next one is ad hoc conversations. So ad hoc conversations is when you just phone somebody up to check something or talk about something. And so sometimes that's through messages, sometimes it's through virtual conversations. Okay. Social interactions are okay. You know what, it's all right to um, send a few 
messages to one of your colleagues that has nothing to do with work, about to do with what they did at the weekend, about what, to do what you're doing. It's okay to ring somebody up and just have a five, 10 minute conversation with them that has nothing to do with work. It is okay to check up on your colleagues' well being. You, if you do this, if you start to build these relationships, you will start to understand when your colleagues are struggling and you will start to know when you need to check up with them. Okay. These ad hoc conversations are really good for inviting opinions, ideas, and contributions. Ring them up, talk about something socially, and then go, oh, by the way, what do you think about us putting this bit in the template over here? You're not catching them off guard. You're actually just building that um, ability for them to feel that they can contribute freely. Okay. And again, value, recognize, and act upon that input. So back to the face-to-face. -face. Okay. Use your face-to-face -face time when you're on campus to build on those virtual relationships that you've started. Okay. Go to see people and say hello. Okay. Take time to chat in the corridor or in the elevator or walk into another building when you bump into people that are part of your project team or people who are involved with that project. Have working coffee meetings with them. Okay. Have social coffee meetings with them. Just go, hey, John, what are you doing next Tuesday? I'm on campus, if you're on campus, shall we go and grab a coffee? Okay. And engage in social events outside work that these people are likely to be at. It is entirely okay, in my opinion, and in my boss's opinion, who is our pro vice chancellor, to spend half a day or a day on campus just going around and talking to people and building that social equity with them. It's really valuable. So influencing, how are we doing on time? Uh, about, uh, about, coming up to your 10 minutes. Coming up to my 10 minutes. I'm, do, I'm doing well on time today. Right, okay. So use the relationships you built to understand what is important to stakeholders and team members. So you, you can use this with all stakeholders, not just with your team members. Frame your communications to appeal to their ethos and pathos and present a rational case when you're trying to get them to buy into something and agree to something. Okay. I'm going to give you an example of something that went drastically wrong. Okay. Uh, we run an award at the university called the Global Professional Award. Uh, Warwick runs a similar thing. It um, Basically, all students are invited to um, take part in this. Uh, it um, appeals to our organisational strategy, so our synergy with that. They get a management qualification out of it at the end. They get a CMI level five qualification to the students. It talks to them about employability, entrepreneurship, and self-management of well-being. We went to our midwife department, midwifery department, to sell this to them because we needed their support in driving their students to partake in this award. And we said, it appeals to organizational strategy. And they went, oh, we're not bothered about organizational strategy. There's a strategy document somewhere. I can't remember what, what, what was in it. And we said, well, your students, if they do this, they'll get a management qualification, they'll get a CMI management qualification. And when midwifery department said, there's no value. There's no value in our industry, that CMI qualification. And we said, but it, it will help them get a job. And they went, they don't need a job. They get a job by the end of their second year because there is such a shortage of midwives. They get a provisional job offer. And we said, it'll build their entrepreneurship skills. And they went, nobody sets up as an independent midwife. Why would they need entrepreneurship skills? And we said, it helps them manage their self well being. And they went, yeah, well, we do some of that in the course anyway. He said, but there's no harm in a bit of systematic repetition. So we went away, tail between our legs. Okay. We talked to people in the NHS, NHS, we talked to other midwives, we talked to midwifery students. We went back three months later, hadn't changed anything. All we did was reframe our sales pitch. And we said, it appeals to our core, our, our core values, which is to provide the best possible differencing level education we can for our students. And then when that's great, that's actually our university strategy. We just said it's our core values. And we said it prepares them for management. So it's not about getting them their first job. It's about employability planning. It's about planning where you go next and taking that next step into management. And they went, that's great. Yeah, we love that. That'd be fantastic for our students. And we went, 
it's about sustainable career management as well. It's about where you go, that um, CMI qualification allows you to move towards that management goal and allows you to plan and move up the ladder. So it's not about the qualification, it's about the skills you get from doing that management qualification. And they went, that's fabulous. And we said, it's about entrepreneurship, but actually it's also about intrapreneurship. It's about being enterprising internally within your organization. It's about knowing how to make changes, make things better, how to come up with ideas, how to go, oh, look, boss, if we did this, this would happen and this would happen. And they went, that's fabulous. And we said, and it's still about well-being. And they went, great, okay. And at the end of it, they actually said to us, this is a really fantastic opportunity. Can we roll this out to our postgraduate students as well as our undergraduate students? So what I'm trying to say here, it's about framing. So influencing people very much is about understanding their ethos. It's about using language which appeals to their pathos. It's about putting forward a rational arg argument and framing it against the backdrop of that ethos and pathos. And that's how you get people on your side. Okay, so I'm almost there. Problem still to overcome. Workshop facilitation. I can't do that online. Like, like you were saying, face-to-face, -face, if, I, if I need to unpick a process within a school with about 10 different people, I don't know how to do that on Teams. It just doesn't work for me. Face-to-face -face workshop is always better. Okay. Don't be a slave to your Teams messages. As soon as a message pops up, you don't have to read it there and then. You can continue what you're doing and then come back to it. Okay. When you're working from home, know when to take a break. I don't always. And the other thing is, it's more difficult to understand colleagues' workload and pressures when you're not physically seeing them in the office environment. Okay. So, where next? So, I still have a lot to learn, but my experience is that hybrid work and the collaboration tools available can help to build good relationships and a better esprit de corps and underpin successful project leadership. And as a final bit on here, if I can build a successful COVID-19 test center without actually setting a foot on campus, then you can do anything virtually. Okay. Now, I'm just gonna to talk to you slightly about me. I'm an introvert, okay? I have members of my family and some friends who have autistic spectrum disorder. And whilst I would not get a diagnosis, I have some personality traits that are on that spectrum. That's why it's a spectrum, it's a sliding scale, okay? I also have some personality traits which are slightly on the OCD scale as well, okay? Now, OCD at its highest level can be an absolutely soul-destroying illness for people, so I'm nowhere near that, but I'm incredibly particular. I know where everything is in my house to a point that I know which drawer it is in and which part of that drawer it is in. Okay, so whilst those traits, that organisation, that pedanticness helps me be very organised in project management, I find building relationships quite exhausting, okay, because I am an introvert. And a lot of the relationship skills I have are skills that I've learned over the years. They are not natural skills. So when you see me tonight and I look a bit socially awkward and clumsy, and a bit odd, it's because I am. Okay, so I'll take any questions. Uh, I'll go for this gentleman first. Well, it's more of an observation actually on the um, the principles, first principles you talked about meetings and giving people terms yep. and the inclusivity. We well, essentially described about half of the thinking environment process of running meetings. I don't think we're aware of the, the process of the thinking environment. I, I'm not aware of that process. You've essentially described, you know, half, if not more, of the process of how a thinking environment works where you everybody's inclusive. You start off with a, an ice spray, hit again when you talk yeah. about the breakfast, and then you move into the main meat of it, and then you give everybody a chance, and then you finish off with um, 
uh, uh, praise. You give people to say, well, thanks, John, for helping me this week solve this problem. Out. So I would advise you to uh, have a look at the thinking brain, because you're pretty much doing most of it and obviously very well. But there is a framework which is similar. That's, to that's, that's really useful. Yeah. Gentleman here has just um, asked me a question about the synergies with what I've been talking about and a framework called the thinking environment for running meetings, both face to face and probably on on yeah. virtually as well. Uh, something I've not come across before, but I'm going to go and have a look at that. Thank you. And the one thing I would say is that thinking environment, if you're doing that in a face to face, requires very good chairing. Yes. Okay. Microsoft Teams meeting whilst it still should be chaired very well, almost naturally encourages that turn-taking paradigm. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a strict process that everybody has to follow. As everybody has to follow. So yeah. You're pretty much doing most of that. Probably. Right, thank you. Stephen. Just in terms of the team side of things, now you spoke about the old wheel. You also spoke about people's backgrounds and getting them into their lives. Yeah. And find out more about them. What about the etiquette of having cameras on? More about those large scale meetings, the small ones that, you know, they can be able to have. Did you introduce any of those uh, at all those meetings? In the, in the large, we, we seem to have a culture at Huddersfield where everybody puts their camera on. Okay. Uh, sometimes people turn it off for a few seconds. Sometimes people lurk in the background, and that's okay. I think having the camera on is great because I think you get the visual cues from people. If I'm running a virtual training course, I specifically request that my learners put their camera on unless they feel dreadfully uncomfortable about doing that because I can get visual cues from them as whether people are engaging with what I'm saying about. Otherwise, it feels to me like I'm, I'm teaching an empty room. So uh, the culture we've got at Huddersfield, for the meetings, it's not a problem. For running online training delivery, I do specifically ask for people to put their cameras on, but I won't force people to do it if they feel uncomfortable with that. I, I have one colleague who never puts his camera on. I, I have no idea why. Did we have any more questions? Uh, just to say, thanks for the presentation. And it, and it, it's really interesting, different to what I was expecting. But it feels like what you've um, shown is the um, emotional intelligence side to project management. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I have two terms that I'm trying to get everybody to pick up on. One is compassionate project management. Everybody talks about compassionate pedagogy. We, we need to embrace compassionate project management. And actually that relationship building and that influencing skills is what makes the difference between a project manager and a project officer, okay? The other term that I'm trying to get out there is frolic. Frolic, you're trying to make kind of friends out of your colleagues. They're a half colleague, half friend. So they're like people who you have really good chats with about what you watched on TV, what you did in the weekend. They're not quite entered that friend zone where you go out with them for a few drinks and go cycling with them at the weekend. But... Um, if you can make your project team your frolics, you will have a much more successful project implementation phase. And emotional intelligence, absolutely, yeah. Okay. It's, it's kind of interesting because when you look at emotional intelligence and you also look at charisma, they're inextricably linked. And that sounds a really weird thing to do, but go, go and do some research into charisma and what makes somebody charismatic and then put them against the... Um, framework of emotional intelligence. And they're pretty much the same. Brilliant. That brings us to time now. So thank you so much, Andy. Fabulous. We appreciate your sharing. Thank you all for your engagement. Really appreciate it.